Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Fink IV, and we are here with Dean Frankel from Melbourne, Australia. And today we're going to learn a little about the history of overtone singing and how to actually do it ourselves. So, Dean, that was awesome, as always. I always look forward to hearing you do that. So many of you might be watching already know that I hold the current Guinness World Record for the longest continuous note. And this beautiful man to my left or right, I'm not sure where he's going to be, actually was gracious enough to allow me to take that record once upon a time. Uh, you held it for, I think it was four and a half years. Yes, yeah, so for four and a half years, a single um, fundamental for 57 seconds in a low register while doing harmonic overtones, which is infinitely cooler than my record, which consisted of a it's just a flat line. So I kind of cheated, I, I think. You on that. What you did is incredible. I, I don't think that you've lost the license for cool to become a <laughs> massive and the first person to officially get to a minute, which is what I wanted when I got to 57. And I did 63 in rehearsal just in the lead up. And I had done 85 in training, but under the pressure of television. Oh, and yeah. Music, I, I just didn't quite get it past 57, but I was happy with that. What you did is way cool. Uh, you know, I salute you on that. Oh, well, I appreciate that. And it's the, I had the same experience I had because the last record that I got was two minutes and one second. But my rehearsal, of course, is way longer. And then you get that little adrenaline rush. It is your heart starts speeding up and it just robs you of so much. But anyway, um, it, this was in 2000 and... I think nine, nine is when I had discovered Dean's YouTube video. And I was like, who is this guy making, it sounded like you had a, a, a syrinx, right? So, so a syrinx is the, 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 the a larynx that a, a bird would have with two independent folds creating multiple tones. And it's just, it's just beautiful. It's like wind chimes. And then he did it for such an extended period of time. So I did take the record at that time, but we connected and we've become friends and we've been exchanging ideas and helping each other grow throughout the years. So it's, it's been, it's been an amazing process, but a little more about Dean. He's actually a wellness breathing instructor. He's a speech coach to professional speakers and political leaders, a university lecturer, a successful author in books with speech, singing, meditation. Um, you're an inventor, you're a recording artist. You've appeared on countless television and radio programs as an expert and, and as a performer. And you play some really unique instruments. You've got the didgeridoo, uh, the jaw harp. Is yeah, that I'm probably one? not as good with the jaw harp. But yeah. yeah, and then the Native American flute. And you yep. just, so a lot of exotic instruments that you've taken on. And on top of that, you are one of the world's leading experts in harmonic overtone singing. So that is why we are here today, and I'm really excited to uh, discuss this with you. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about just the history of harmonic overtone singing and, and why it exists. Thank you, Richard. It's a lovely uh, lead up to that. Um, harmonic overtone singing comes from the genre of throat singing. Um, throat singing is the world's oldest known form of singing. Um, it has been practiced by tribes all over the world, um, tribes in Mongolia, in Tuva, in Tibet, tribes in Papua New Guinea, tribes in the Amazon, tribes in Africa. Um, I'm sure Aboriginal tribes in Australia also, but they don't have any evidence now, so it probably died off. The didgeridoo is very closely related to it as well. The Chukchi tribe of Siberia on the other side of Alaska, they do a different type. There's many different types of throat singing. But on the other side, the Canadian Inuits also practice a kind of throat singing. And the Canadian Inuits were once from um, the other side of Siberia. So 
throat singing is a, a very unusual way of using the voice as an instrument, but also uh, it's also a remarkable wellness activity. You mentioned all of these different places around the globe that show records of, of throat singing. But you also mentioned there's different kinds. So in, in what way are they different? So what I presented you with just before was um, high overtone singing. And, and that is, uh, it is native to Mongolia, but it has been, uh, it has evolved uh, largely in Germany, actually. In Germany is the centre of Western overtone singing, which is oh. my main practice of it. So there's high harmonic, which I've got, uh, which is a little bit more advanced. So um, I'm throwing my voice. So you're going to hear it louder when I'm further away. If I go, but then if I go over here, So you're throwing the voice. And in olden times, that was very handy because it was a, a real way of communing with nature. It was a way of attracting animals. It was a way of calming very uh, nervous animals and was a big reason why a lot of people ate at night because they would mesmerise certain animals um, now, I don't use it for that reason. And um, I imagine that was a form of communication just within the tribe too then, right? So they were... Well, that's right. The communication becomes really interesting. This is uh, the Tibetans who took it up at about between 11 and 1200 AD. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's more of a recent one. So, so throat singing is so old, it makes classical singing by comparison <laughs> as modern rap. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So the Tibetans, they, they believe that when they're doing their throat singing, they believe that they're accessing their, their ancestors and their great masters, their great spiritual masters. And there is an aspect that when you're doing this, another, another part of the brain is being stimulated and you go into a bit of a trance state. So it can be really hard to count to 10 when you're doing it which is really hard when you're going through Guinness World Record. You, know, um, <laughs> you have that awareness, yeah. It sounds like those long, continuous breaths and manipulating that challenges your breathing and your parasympathetic nerve system and everything else in the process. Do you give yourself specific uh, exercises or goals to develop the skills that you have for um, meditational purposes, or is it just something? Not anymore. So you just do it, and that is a ticket to wherever you're going to go. As long as you do it, you know, if you're doing it in nature, if you're, you're looking at the stars, if you're singing to animals, as I sometimes do, you automatically go into this other state. Mm. And you can go really quite deep into it. And, and in the olden days, I couldn't talk after I sang for, for quite a while. I, I, I lost my, and I'm, I'm a speaker. And I lost my capacity. <laughs> uh, you get it's a, it's a mindfulness that is different again to mindfulness as we know. It is a um, uh, your senses, your eyes, your ears are so stimulated. Even the food seems to taste better after you do it. Mm. Uh, you're absolutely right. The parasympathetic nervous system via the vagus nerve is stimulated by this. Uh, I, I use heart monitors to test my heart rate when I do it. My heart rate usually goes down by about 20% when I do it. Wow. Do you use overtone singing um, for your, just your day-to-day -day kind of health for yourself? I know you teach this as well. Um, not only is it that, but it's also a spiritual practice. But, but coming back to your earlier to your yes. question that I didn't quite get to, is there are some of the other overtone techniques that are different that are worth exploring. One of them involves the OM, it's the open vowel harmonic. And you, you find the, the eight sacred tones of the OM. I'll give you a demo of that. Yes, please. 
That is so cool. So some of you are watching this right now. Uh, you might have noticed the, the the sound collapsed a little bit towards the end, and that that's just Zoom saying, "Oh, this is what is this weird anomaly we, that must not be intentional." So it kind of kind of fades it out a little bit. You can hear all those like almost like a whistle tone that's peeking through on top, which is which is really cool. So that ohm is very uh, a different technique then than the L that you suggested earlier. Then correct. That's right. Um, so different technique in that it's, it's open valve harmonics as opposed to higher harmonics. So mm -hmm. on, the, on the spectrum in the overtone series, it's, it's lower, the simple. Gotcha. Now, was that something that would be separate? Like that would be like one tribe versus another or a different part of the world? So the Tuvans have a whole lot of different techniques. And they are different, for example, to the Khorsa tribe of South Africa, who have a different way of doing it again. But that is a particularly good one for animals. Um, uh, I, I know I've been able to mesmerise possums up in a tree uh, who look at me and think, my God, what are you doing? I don't understand this. <laughs> I don't scared anymore. Um, a dog's cat's, it's a beauty. Um, yeah. like another technique, this is another high technique, um, this is doing E, and this is one that, that I'll be giving some instruction for here because you can get it. Well, pretty much most people can get it straight away. Awesome. But know that throat singing, uh, harmonic overtone singing is the art of under singing. It's precision projection. So you only sing as loud uh, and it's uh, what happens, it magnifies. So So you've also got to get a refined listening ability. So it's uh, really, so in other words, what you're saying is that because you're fundamental, your folds are vibrating at a consistent speed underneath. And then the overtones is basically where, wherever there's a specific shape, acoustical space that it's reflecting in and that's what's being amplified. So it's the that's projection exactly right. of specific frequencies. So not only that, it's also surgical precision shapes in the mouth. And this is why it's so important to be able to adjust your shapes in slow motion, because if you can do it, you find then the resonance. And then when you find it, you pickle it. You know, you make sure you reproduce it again. Thanks. So this is the, the basic ear high overtone technique. And in order to get it, you've got to create a buzz before you can manipulate the harmonics out of it. And the buzz is lots of harmonics. And that goes like this. And if I face that way, you're going to hear the reflection in the room. So it is an ambient form of singing. All right, you, you made that look way too easy. So maybe, maybe you could take us a little bit step by step on that one. Is it just any loud E? Beep. You're just selecting a note and just going. Um, that, that, that's a lovely E. I can, I can tell straight away you've got a, beautifully vintage, a beautiful vintage voice for this. But you probably don't quite go as loud. So E and allow the buzz on the voice. Okay. So once you keep that buzz going, you stay in ear position with the tongue. Okay. So the only thing that consciously changes is the lips. The lips is like the fingers on a flute. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can see there's just this very subtle adjustments that kicks right into a different overtone. And you said you're, the, the tongue, so with an E vowel, it's kind of like the, the mid shape of the tongue going up. That's not moving at all for you. That's entirely lips. 
it's 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 like a naughty teenager. <laughs> so everything else, <laughs> everything else is moving in concert, but the naughty teenager is staying <laughs> steadfast. So I'm going to ask everybody who's watching this to to give this a try. So. When you're referring to the buzzing, you're just referring to the sensation of the sound waves, right? It's just yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. So, he, and then you went to an, almost an ooh shape, like a U. Uh, and slow motion into ooh. All right. So, let's, let's everyone try this together. Here we go. He, I don't think I'm doing this right. Uh, you are doing it well. You, you, um, you got about two really good harmonics okay. that, rings, that, that rang, and you had two harmonics that were right on the edge. It was actually really good. You know what I'm going to try? I'm going to try this with the, the ears out. Let me hear the room. I'm going to, I'm going to try this again. E can hear them okay uh you richard that was superb uh i've been doing this since 1993 so that makes it 27 years you just in in a matter of minutes um you, that was that eight years ah. down the <laughs> um, it, was <laughs> it was like you played six different notes of the flute i heard once i heard the one i was like oh and like you said of once you find something you want to become aware of that shape that position and then repeat that so that was that was kind of cool hopefully everybody watching this was able to i mean you can this is running live but after press pause try it listen to yourself and, and then go back and it's fun to do and i have to admit i strangely feel excited it's not just a cool sound there's the feeling of that frequency you get kind of get bathed in that sound it's 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 fun it, it is fun it is highly meditative it's very sound meditation all but it's also about having control over your lips control over your projection so if you're anxious you can't do it because then you'll over sing you've got to find the resonant balance um now what happens when you practice this enough is every time you practice like you're doing push-ups for for these muscles which become very handy later in life too so i'm going to show you some of the epiglottal muscles that have come up as i do so. I'm just exploring. You guys ex at home, explore. Uh, see if you can kind of have a, a, a feel. And Dean, you tell me if I'm in the ballpark here. And, oh, now I'm choosing the same note as you. Mm -hmm. It's just a fundamental. Is that, that bass note, so to speak, relevant to each person? Should it be a different note? or Such a, such a relevant question. I'm kicking myself that I didn't say it. So. We've all got our signature zones, our zones where we resonate at best. Okay. Uh, and there's often a, a big difference between men and women. And women will usually, obviously, be better at the higher ones a lot of the time and men at the lower ones. Um, this is also relevant because traditionally in some of these throat singing cultures, women were banned from doing this. Really? So, so this is actually a triumph. Not only are you singing sacred tones, but you're defying the old ban. And, and, and yet, on the other side, the cause of women of South Africa and the Canadian women, they're the ones who do harmonics and the blokes don't or didn't. That's why. Um, um, and much in the same way, didgeridoo, there's this nonsensical ban on women playing didgeridoo by Aboriginal Australians here. Nonsensical because there is no instrument in the world that is better for your lungs, for your developing your muscles than playing didgeridoo. And, and I have permission to teach women didgeridoo, 
by the Guruwiwi family, and they are the original custodians of the didgeridoo. It's really a wonderful thing for, for women and for men to be able to do this skill. It's a liberation. That's incredible you're, you're a, a part of that too. That, that's, that's fantastic to hear. So going back to that then, the, the selection <clears throat> note is going to be relative to just the acoustical space of your instrument at a rested state then, I would imagine. So it's um, that, but also in your external environment. I think of every space that we are ringing out in harmonics as a mini concert hall. Mm. Uh, and there's the internal space and the external space. A smaller, high pitch woman can do incredible harmonics that I could not do. Sure. Um, and, and a bloke with a really deep voice, um, which I don't actually really have. <laughs> it's sort of, you, They're going to you know, produce their own relative. You will, and there are different things, different colours which come out. I mean, the, the difference between the human being and an instrument is that the human being who's singing harmonics can play the violin, can play the cello, and play the double bass. Sure. Whereas the double bass can play the cello if it's really stretching itself, <laughs> but the instrument doesn't change shape. But right. the human instrument can. And on top of that, it is so malleable in, in based on our life's experiences and our exposures and our desires. So our brain, obviously hardwired to our instrument. So the muscles that Dean showed us in action when he was doing that last technique is something that we're all physically capable of. It just, even it may not come out that quickly and that easily. It's kind of like learning to walk, right? If you've never tried to walk before, you're going to fall a bunch of times and it's this, or learning a new language, you're going to slur things. It's the exact same thing. So the art of repetition and discipline, of course, is, is going to do that. I just want to throw that out there because if you don't get it right away, I don't want you to think for a second that you're not capable of it. You just... Totally true. Yeah. Um, I, I can add to that uh, and the beautiful points you just made. Um, uh, my oldest person who was a regular started at the age of 80, okay? By the age of 81, she had developed these muscles. Um, most people do not hear their harmonics straight away, but uh, I can absolutely guarantee that everyone is capable of it as long as you can hear it mm. and as long as you can develop the ability to listen to it. But it's a sensitivity to sound that also means that you can start to hear the, the rumblings of the washing machine or, or the fridge when you weren't conscious of it. But it's, it's listening like an animal. These are, these are the sounds of nature. This is the language of animals. It's the language of the wind. You know, every harmonic singing effort has a metaphor in nature somehow or other. And, and that is really crucial to the spirit of it as well. Nearly everything about it is counterintuitive. So you've got to try less hard, not more hard. You are not singing songs. You are using the body as an instrument and drawing out the, the internal and external resonances. Hmm. You will routinely sing a singing note for about twice as long as the average singer will, partly because the breath control in getting that resonance means that it will go about twice as long, uh, which is also similar to didgeridoo. It's also why I initially took that for Guinness, um, because I wanted to... Demonstrate um, that. To demonstrate this, this amazing form of singing that was unknown in the country, almost totally unknown in the country I was in. Within half an hour, a million people had seen it. And it wasn't unknown anymore. Um, <laughs> so going back to that technique, we kind of derailed a little bit. Well, I derailed the, the interview because <laughs> I got excited. But um, if you can just show real quick again that movement that we're looking for. Kind of. Into all. Um, but, but I've got to tell you, every single different vowel and soft consonant is a harmonic technique of its own. Sure. For example, N for Nelly. Mm -hmm. 
you would have heard the tonal change. That's not as pretty. Um, in tuba, they call it dum chuck ta, which has nothing to do with drinking. Um, <laughs> but that, that obviously resonated more in the nasal cavities, right? Because the airflow is going up into there. You're not getting the, the, the richness of the, the oral space as much in that Which one. is a tremendous way to clear the nasal passages for singing. So it so e becomes... It's almost like a Y-ish kind of sensation. You, 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 like. and, and I cheated because once I went from <laughs> E to U, then I lifted the tongue up into L. L, L, o, L. And, that, and that's what gave, and so when you started to kind of do that bounce and you're like jumping harmonics, that was more of like when you had like an L position, the tongue had moved at that point. Or the tongue has to move, obviously, in order for that to exactly. bounce. And if you want to practice an exercise that will exercise those muscles, there are two that I do in my wellness breathing program. One is... Yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yeah, and you can feel it. Yeah, yo, yeah, yo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yeah, yo. Yeah, and that's doing the same thing. And the other one is Lia, Leo, 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 Lia, Leo. Lia, lio, lia, lio. That's tongue twister. Just minimize it. Lia, say lia, lio. Lia, lio, lia. It's really about aiming for stillness as opposed to stiffness. When you're in the same position, mm. lia, lio. So you're really, really chill. Lia, lio, lia, lio, lia, lio, lia. And it's almost like there's a band playing a rhythmic true even though it's right. not yeah i can start to hear it a little bit there that's also about developing the epiglottal muscle in ways that other forms of singing don't but louis armstrong when you saw him playing his trumpet and that came out like a bird, absolutely he did do it how this can relate to throga for example is one is the breath control Mm -hmm. uh, and breath control practice. But two, you're controlling minute movements of articulation, which all of these skills pass over to the other forms of singing. And speech, and, and, I would imagine, of course. Oh, but, but this is what got me into speech. Um, speech totally. Because what happens each time you get a position, your, your neuromuscular connections get established and enforced and then consolidate it. So it relates so well to Throga and the hearing. And, and the, the, you know, one thing about singing and speech, actually, is that there are a few things in life that involve this many skills to come into one meta skill. You've got to do a hell of a lot of things in order to get that one meta skill happening. So I, I kind of want to take this one step further. You mentioned the connection to throw, and of course, articulation would address any technique, of course, as well. But this does even more than that because you're really addressing just in that one demonstration, the uh, in just that you know two second exercise, you're actually addressing four dimensions uh, of the seven dimensions. You've got, of course, your breathing, and it's really, when I'm extracting from what you're saying, it's really the art of minimalization, right? It's how little can you spend to achieve the sound? And this absolutely applies here, of course. The usage of air, the coordination of the muscles around the lungs. Then you've got the articulation. You also have, of course, the tone because you're manipulating the resonating space as a, as a whole. So as you work on this, you're becoming, I love what you said, you become more aware of just the sounds and the overtones, you're going to hear it in the washing machines and the bird flying by and just nature. You're going to pick up new things. I refer to that as a producer's ear, right? Someone who can hear and understand the range of frequencies that we tend to just take for granted. And then the fourth thing is actually strength. The stability 
of your vocal folds to be in a single position for five seconds, 10 seconds, a minute, mm -hmm. vibrating at a constant speed while manipulating the space above takes an incredible uh, stamina and stability of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx. So you're really, you're targeting a tremendous amount of coordination in two seconds. And then when you extend that for, of course, for a minute in, in an extreme scenario, you are absolutely going to a meditational yogi state of mind because that's what's required to even execute that. You just said it just beautifully. Um, another really important aspect of this is that we are dealing with developing some of the smallest muscles in the human body. So the good news is the bigger the muscles, the harder it is to develop them more. But the little muscles respond better to exercise than the big muscles. So you get strong really quite quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is that if you have been doing other forms of singing for years, playing, speaking, yoga, you have a head start on everyone else. You know, I can hear when someone talks or sings, I will often say, yep, there'd be a good one. Yep, there'd be a good one. <laughs> Richard, you're clearly a good one. Oh, I appreciate <laughs> that. So I really want to encourage anybody watching this to, to explore this. We've talked about some of the benefits in just your body awareness, just musical awareness and what you're hearing uh, helps with speech, with singing, the, the brain chemistry. There's so many benefits to this in just as a daily practice, even if the agenda is curiosity, right? Just for fun. I just want to throw that out there because I, I know I had a lot of fun in just those a couple times that I tried to say, and hopefully for those watching, you did as well. Do you have maybe a recommendation of how often or how to practice to kind of get people progressing? Now, now obviously, uh, you, you teach um, this specifically, and we're going to give that information here as well. So if anybody is curious with private lessons with Dean, we'll, of course, make that uh, information available. But on our own, what can we do? Okay, great question. Um, I love it if someone can do three minutes practice a day. You do three minutes practice a day, you'll get good at this really quickly. The more you do, the better. It's one of those things that if you do do it for an hour, um, you're going to get better again. And <laughs> I'd also say some of the traditional forms of throat singing that can be practiced, that I've retired actually, aren't great for the throat. So that's more of the subharmonic growls that you'll hear from some of the traditional Mm. societies that there were there have been cases of tibetans having bleeding throats after doing it for three hours going in their hypnotic state and, and damaging so it's one of the reasons why i've been drawn to the let's not do that <laughs> but, but it's important to say it because some yeah, will I, either can do that so what i would do and i encourage others to do it if you've got the gall and if you've got no sense of shame like i didn't have I would see an acoustic space and I would consider that acoustic space to be something that's not owned by anyone. And so I would often test my voice into that space. So I'd go and I'd go. So I'd often do that. And, and sometimes people would look at me like I'm an alien and I wouldn't care. So one thing is to do that. You see a space, if you know some of the techniques, then put it out there. See what works and what doesn't. Um, second thing, try it on animals. Try it on dogs, try it on cats. See what animals are aware. And what happens is you have a communion with nature of a different level. I love nothing more than singing my harmonics to a, an animal of a different species. Nothing more, it's just great had one with a giraffe where the giraffe looked at me for 10 minutes like, what the <laughs> hell are you doing? <laughs> you know, I'll never, I'll never forget that. Um, so, so try it on animals. See how you can project your voice as if you're not trying. Mm. But, you know, sometimes you'll find harmonic things go, <laughs> they'll build themselves up. <laughs> and they're trying too hard. So, so this is about getting rid of the tension and balancing yourself off, being still 
and connecting with nature. Dean, thank you so much for your time. These techniques, um, I'm hoping it's going to reach people that maybe stumble into this. Maybe they're reaching out specifically to learn this technique and, and they found you, which is great. But in the very least, I'm hoping many of you watching just play, try, experiment. It's things like this. It's art forms that get lost, that get overlooked, that can have a tremendous impact. There's a reason it's been around for thousands of years. So to keep that alive, I thank you for that. And I appreciate you taking the time to teach us today. And Richard, it's been my total privilege and pleasure. There is one thing that you've been talking about that I, I really have to mention, and that is making these sounds is very similar to the sounds that we used to sometimes make as a child before mm. we were told off. And it is a way of, of making peace with that part of your childhood and being able and allowed to develop the child sounds because we're singing like a child, we're singing like an animal. And, and that's okay, that's actually really good. It makes us better singers uh, when we're singing like humans. I absolutely love that. Dean, thank you again very much for your time. Thank you everybody for tuning in and watching. Thank you, Richard. Shake hands. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual hug. Virtual hug. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Richard. My you pleasure. Bet. Take care. Bye.